national security in contemporary Nigeria, internal and external. I wasn't too happy that Dr. Bukar didn't go in depth into making reference to Nigeria. But I wouldn't blame him. We know why. <laughs> I will just tell you one. One of the reasons is that people that are very close to security, they don't open their mouths too wide. They hide a lot. And I think I want to submit that Dr. Booker has hidden a lot from us today. When we are talking of internal security, we are talking of challenges such as ethno-religious crisis, socio-political conflicts, mismanagement of the country's resources, civil unrest and insurgency, kidnapping, armed robbery, and the likes. That, those constitute the major features of internal security. And when we are talking about external security, like he brought out in the paper, we are dealing with a global system. And that hegemony global powers are making insecurity an issue in developing countries. And I think he brought that out very well. So, as we relate to a global world, I think internally we have to sit down and know how we will relate with that global system. And one of the things I'm thinking about is that there must be a good balance between the public and the private sector in our systems internally. I think generally there are problems. I want Dr. Booker to note a few issues that probably he will elaborate for us. One of them is that on page three of his paper, if we look at the last paragraph, he made statements like the motives and actions of some countries and international organizations may pose great dangers to a country's survival. We cannot agree less with that statement. The next sentence, for instance, over the last few decades, some foreign organizations and countries loaded some countries with ill-tailored loans, etc., etc., etc. The issue of elaboration we want here is one is not too comfortable when you say some countries. Who are these countries? It will help us to know where we are going. Some international organizations, which are these? Are we talking of WTO? Are we talking of IMF? And so we need clarification along those lines. You have talked about media as a factor in this security concern. I agree entirely with you. In fact, lately, is as I remember some years ago, America came up with the idea of roadmap. And everywhere in the world, through the CNN and so on, everybody that is talking of his program will use the word roadmap. Why must we? You talked about copycat and so on. What I am asking is, what can we do about this media hegemony? Because if something is not done, this security or no security we are talking about will be a problem. Because once they sell this idea through CNN, uh, BBC, and so on, it creates problems for developing countries. So what can we do? I think you left, you don't want to say something about it, but I think it's important you tell us what we can do. You talked about corruption, that it has hindered Nigeria from attaining human security. 
We agree entirely to that. The question is, how do we, you are talking of civil society and so, how can we be a major check to the government of the day so that this evil, we can get rid of it in our society? We have talked at length about leadership. And I want to observe that too often when we talk about leadership, I think we hide a lot of things. One of the things we hide is that we don't emphasize the class dimension of this leadership we are talking about. Too often people talk of leadership as, as if it's a one-man show or a few people. It's a class interest. And if we don't know it at that level, to tackle that problem, we will run into problem. It's a class that we're dealing with. And the common man must know how he will face this challenge of the leadership problem in our society. Secondly, one of the things we, I think we hide also is that when we talk about leadership, we are just talking about the state, the Nigerian state, for example, uh, and just leave it at that. I think leadership, for it to make very effective meaning in solving this problem of security in our country, has to do with leadership at all levels. All levels are important in my view. At the family level, leadership is very important. Religious leader is very important. Institutional leadership, very important. Before we even talk of leadership at the very top. So, we should be thinking of emphasizing some of these things. I strongly believe that when we're talking about leadership, we should not think that leadership will eliminate conflicts and problems. I think what we are looking for in leadership is the ability to manage conflicts and bring about meaningful solutions. One other problems, problem I have with the paper is I think there are areas that Dr. Booker will have helped us if he gave us statistics, and I know he has them in his bag. <laughs> For example, how much was spent on military? How much is spent on education? How much is spent on agriculture? We need such statistics. It has its own problems, like the economist is looking at me. Statistics has its own problems sometimes. But at least let's know that, for example, in 1976, 15 point something percent was said to have been spent on the military and six point something on education. I think even that statistic, whatever its problem, will tell us a story. How can you be spending 15 point something on military when we don't even have any external threat and then you are spending six percent on education? I think we need statistics in some areas. <laughs> I also looked at your statistics on page seven. I think it's a very good statistics. When you were presenting, sir, you left out Democratic Republic of Congo. That's your first one. You started with Egypt. Certainly, these are the prone countries. I was thinking we will add the recent problematic one, CAR, to that list. Then your quotation below, which I think emphasizes Nigeria, somehow does not tally very well in my view with the above statistics. I don't know whether I'm not getting it right. Probably you will say a word or two on that. Then when I looked at the chairman, I have just two minutes more. Uh, I should round up. <laughs> okay. When I looked at the issue of the new concept of security, 
not emphasizing the military, but on human security. I looked at, I think you have a statistics. I'm not happy that you didn't comment on it. It's a very excellent statistics on page six. Type of security, definition threats. I think the human, uh, human, what do you call it now? Development Index has done an excellent job. And from your footnotes, you brought out very clearly that it was great economics from developing countries, that is Pakistan and India, that articulated and came up with that position. And you told us the history that it started with the issue of human rights, which has produced this, and it's excellent. I agree with it. My only issue is that you didn't emphasize it. I think it's a very important statistic. But good as it came from human rights, I think the hegemonic class are also taking human rights to another extreme. An extreme where, and you mentioned it, sir, that they now want to impose on us before we get one assistance or the other, we must allow gay marriage to take place in our society. I think that human rights has gone haywire. And I thought you would have said a word. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I want to go and sit down. I just want to say that I enjoyed the lecture. And I want to say in closing, that I think what Dr. Booker is telling us about this important issue of leadership, security, and uh, development will go a long way if we heed the warning and advice of Mahatma Gandhi. And this is what Mahatma Gandhi said. He says, there are seven social sins and if we can overcome this social scene, all this issue of leadership, development, will be a non-issue. And these are the seven sins. He says the seven sins manifest in politics without principles. I dare say, I want to submit that our politics in Nigeria is without principles. A situation where you are having politics without even political parties. All that we have are not political parties. If political scientists, if you define politics, political parties very well, these are not parties. PDP, APs, all of them. <laughs> the second principle is wealth without work. Monkey the work. <laughs> well, before I ask the floor, I will just uh, comment on politics and government. During the constitutional conferences, 1953, 57, 58, and 60. He advised our leaders that when you are dealing with public service, please try and take politics out of it. And after explaining, they agreed. And there were the five leaders of the political parties then, Sir Bello, Dr. Azikwe, Chibawolo, um, and Chief Dr. Ewa Ita, they were the leaders of the parties then, and they all signed that they would, they would not um, involve politics in the governance of this country, and that appointment, promotion, and discipline of career officers would be completely out of their hands. 
That was the beginning of having public service commission. And that the people to be appointed public service commissioners were people of a high level of integrity, people of standing, who could face a, a politician and tell him, look, this is not your area, don't do that. And they abided by it. And so, if we take, if we take it, the police, and then they emphasize in particular that the civil service, the police, the judiciary, these are very critical democratic institutions. They must not interfere with their work or even with their appointment. And this is what has been happening all along. That was why politicians felt that civil servants were, more, were very powerful or very influential. Because when the minister comes with his uh, proposal, and he, did, he would, uh, he's not supposed to just say, ah, Go and do this one. He will ask his power and secretary for advice. And no minister ever took decisions without first getting advice from his power and secretary. And the power and secretary has been trained to be politically neutral. Anything he considered, he does he did so just on the basis of the public interest. What is good for the public, not what does the minister want. This was the thing that we went through throughout the First Republic. And in fact, the same system, I think, continued almost the whole of uh, the world's regime. Uh, when well, Mustafa came, he started to do something else. Uh, he, didn't, he didn't change the policy, but he, in, he pushed it by dismissing dis dis um, Chief Justice, dismissing the Chairman of the Service Commission, and so on. But he did not change the system, or that he beat it. And the thing continued up to 1988, when the government decided to bring changes. And the change was the exact opposite of what our leaders agreed to. The appointment, promotion, and discipline of officers in any ministry, in the ministry was now vested in the minister. And that was the beginning of our problem. Minister just started to employ people purely on political basis. And this continued. And someone was saying, I was then head of service, but I wasn't consulted. So when it came to my advice, they, they didn't take it. So I said, look, I'm going, not because I'm a, I'm a, because you have not accepted my advice, but I know that this year thing is not going to work. And if I, I remain in the system and it fails, you will say I sabotage you. So that was how I left. And before long, the whole situation started to crumble. So at a point, Abacha, when he came to power, he appointed a committee to look at that system. He looked at it and agreed to abolish the system that was introduced in 1988. But the same committee also still told him to increase the salaries of civil servants. By that time, the number of civil servants had gone up because of this political appointment and so on. So he said he was not going to increase any, any salaries until the number was reduced. So another committee worked and came up with the um, recommendation that the 30,000 uh, civil servants should be retired because they, you are not supposed to be there anyway. So the, this recommendation was given to him in May 1998, and in June he died. So nothing was done. So even the, the, the system that was introduced, in which he, 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 uh, he uh, repealed, continued up to date, and it is even worse now. There is nothing that is done in government now without considering political, um, political policy. And that is the problem we are in now. Well, how we are going to get out of it, I don't know, but that is the problem. And everywhere, even in America that they are talking about, they don't interfere with, um, they don't deal with career officers. When uh, General Hall became president after this uh, system with the, um, 
Nixon's thing. Yeah, what a gift. When he took over, he thanked the American civil servant for having had the capacity to continue even in the difficult times that there was no political leadership. Now, it happened in Nigeria. The two, two, the first two pools, when it happened, there was no government. But the system continued to put things forward. Now, if there is no government, there is no service that can, can continue because the service has become collapsed. So this is, and look at, even the service and so on, look at how many of your colleagues are now in government. Because that's why you can get uh, some, some, some um, good pay. Whatever. But, but before, before, university, for, you tell professor, come and become a minister of, no, you wouldn't want to read. But that's the situation we are in now. Anyway, that is uh, the position of politics and, uh, and, uh, and governance. And as long as that together, we can't move forward. At all. Uh, well, uh, please uh, introduce yourself. Be very brief and precise. Straight to the point, please. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, sir. And uh, I would want to congratulate the guest lecturer uh, for having delivered this uh, very important and capturing uh, lecture. And again, I will congratulate my erudite professor for filling in the gap. Uh, he's mentioned that there are some things that were kept in the back and were not, oh, okay, sorry. My name is Abu Bakar Zaria Ibrahim from the Department of Philosophy. Uh, the discussant mentioned that there were some things that were kept in the back and back here, I heard us say that we know why. And this is included in some of the statistics that I needed uh, to complete uh, this lecture. But before then, the discussion mentioned the issue of leadership at all levels. So when we're discussing leadership, we're discussing leadership at all levels. So class reps. SUG, Student Union of Government, take notes from top to bottom. So it affects everybody. This lecture touched on issues like security on food, health, environment, elections, etc. But I think I'm going to do, uh, comment on two things unemployment and unnecessary expenditure, with some tangible statistics that you can go and check if you want. The issue of unemployment in Nigeria is so terrible that records have shown 44,000 graduates from universities every year in Nigeria. But the government is only able to create 2,200 employments. So if you calculate, you find that in four years, we have 176,000 graduates in Nigeria. But how many? have a place for government employment, 8,800 out of 176. And when we, mean, when we say employment, we don't mean that going into government, but creating an enabling environment for the graduates to be employed, not, not necessarily to be in government, only 2,200 out of 44,000. That is how bad uh, it has gone. On unnecessary expenditure, for those of you that may know, I come from Kaduna State, and I want to go back a bit into history. In my state, by 1988 up to 1990, the kitchen budget, that is item 7, in Kaduna State Government House was 300,000 per month. Today, what we have is, now, that, that 300,000 uh, per month uh, if, you, if you calculate it, 
for, for one year. What you have is 1.2 1, 1 million, 1.2 million per annum. What we have today is per 2 million per month. Okay? So in a year, you have 156 million for item 7 in the government house. In four years, you will come up with 624 million for item 7. 624 million. Now, let's refer this to underdevelopment. If you live in Savangari, for example, how much will it, will it take for the government to tie the roads of Savangari? If you spend 624 million on item 7, how much will it cost you to construct the roads? So these are the kind of things that we should always refer to and look at and to see to, and to talk to ourselves about leadership and unnecessary expenditure. So it is our, for us now to wake up, see what we can do about leadership from top to bottom. Thank you. Uh, my name is Isaac Isa Ishaq from the Department of Archaeology. Uh, my own issue here uh, is about the issue of security. If you look at the, uh, the deliberation and the presentation uh, about the security nature of the country, looking at the internal conflict, we have this ethno-religious conflict. You have farmers uh, and uh, Ketoriara's uh, conflict, and you have terrorism. And uh, looking at the, okay, and uh, looking at the strong political position uh, this strong nation have in the policy formulation and the management of financial institution in the developing countries. How are we going to place terrorism that is the Boko Haram in Nigeria? And this ethnic religious conflict is Boko Haram the creation of these strong nations to divert the attention of Nigerian development? Are they so scared of the Nigerian potentials politically and the economically of things? It is high time for us in Africa to start looking at the African way of changing our own perception economically. Uh, you know, culturally, and uh, you know, even in security-wise, uh, there, there used to be a time in this nation where you have Great Ife, where you have Zaria, where you have Darul Islam. They have their own security challenges as a day, but they were able to control themselves and, you know, a kind of, uh, you know, terrorism like this Boko Haram. And uh, when you talk about us sitting down with the leaders we have here in Nigeria, who are we going to sit with? When you have this breed of leadership coming from, you know, they were just implementing the policies of these strong nations. Who are we going to sit with and discuss the future of Nigeria? Are we not discussing with people who are just trying to implement the policies of those strong nations? Are they not going to mislead us into implementing the, uh, 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 the roadmap of those people or the policies they presented to us. Thank you very much. I'm Dr. Abdullah Ahmad, Department of English and Literature in Sebi, Zaria. Uh, I want to ask the presenter three questions. Uh, question number one, uh, as a security insider, are you sure the country is going to get over the, the Boko Haram crisis? Because each time we are, we are we, we, there are promises that the government has uh, bought such and such amount of uh, arms and ammunition to fight Boko Haram, 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 Haram group, only for you to discover or to hear that uh, the group are taking over uh, so and so number of uh, local government areas in the part of the country. So that is question number one. Uh, question number two. How can we as Africans become development-oriented? 
uh, obviously, we are consumer-oriented people. We are not contributing much to the development of the world. So how can we, how can we now start uh, 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 using our human resources? We have a lot of uh, talented people uh, all over the world. So uh, how can we uh, um, uh, uh, bring these resources together to develop Africa? Then, uh, question number three. Uh, like the uh, Professor Yedele has mentioned, uh, the West, especially America, is, is using its uh, uh, media power to, to put a lot of uh, ideas into our heads. Uh, some time ago, we, we were quite aware that the, the, the U.S. government has said that Nigeria is going to break up in 2015. Uh, so, in fact, I, I, I'm saying that I, I expected the, the speaker to speak on that issue. As we are talking now, I'm telling you, some of us have the idea of Nigeria a breaking up. I mean, the breaking up of Nigeria. I'm very, I'm, I have to be very sincere with you. But from what the the, 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 the speaker has said, he said that there is a way forward for Nigeria. So really, are we going to have a way forward after 2015 in the, in the country called Nigeria? Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Chairman members of the high table, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. My name is King Esiebo. I'm from the Faculty of Veterinary Medicine. So you begin to wonder why, <laughs> <laughs> what relationship? Um, when I woke up this morning, I know I have three assignments. One, to meet two of my postgraduate students, and I think they have to wait for me. The second is the security issues, which to all of us here is not something you joke about. I'm sure I'm carrying everybody along with that statement. The third is when I've satisfied myself walking throughout the day, I'm happy my team Chelsea is playing this evening, so I can relax. <laughs> now, having said that, I decided to put everything apart to come to this public lecture. Sir, I am sorry I've been disappointed. And I'm happy that Professor Yedili brought out my disappointment that nothing was mentioned about the Nigerian context. And I think these questions that are coming now will afford us the opportunity to hear from the presenter. But I want to say you can be exonerated because one who fights and runs away lives to fight again. And that is why you just glossed over the Nigerian context. I stayed in Nigeria in the fringes of the Civil War as a secondary school boy. I could imagine what I went through. Now imagine those who were inside the enclave of the Civil War. Many people, many of us who were old enough, were beginning to see the signs that historically these things are about to come back. So we were happy that people like Kofi Annan, Gambari, I'm sure one of you know Gambari, he started his career here in this Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences before he left Gambari and Yoku. And if you look at that spectrum, you see a lot of diplomats. The point is Nigeria is now under focus as far as security concerns are concerned. So we cannot come here and gloss over the security issues. So, Mr. Chairman, APU is such a good place. If you say anything here, you will go scot free because it's a place of learning. So, please, sir, educators. And not, we must tell people who are those responsible. The historians cannot be left out, sir. Historians have not told us it in, a comp in, a, in a composite way how we went through this country from before during the Civil War to where we are now. If you have them in small pamphlets, as small children are reading them in the secondary school, you are also telling them what could happen if they mismanage the economy or mismanage the politics. That's one. The lawyers too. Have we asked ourselves, Oscar's case in South Africa, Oscar's case in South Africa, if it was Nigeria, would you have finished that case? No. You keep postponing, adjourning, 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 it we will never see the end. So the judiciary, they are also part of this. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.
Department of Theatre and Performing Arts. Uh, my one is, uh, I would like to, like everybody is saying, he skips so many things. Uh, uh, and people are claiming they know why. I don't know why they should know why on his behalf. <coughs> However, one important segment of the society is left out. And I think the youth, and particularly my concern, is their predicament in this society. One, that is drug abuse. So we have been doing a lot of community projects around just the Samaru community here for almost 10 years now. Every year, the major problem they are concerned with is the drug abuse. It's as every year it is increasing. You can hear a variety of names for the variety of drugs they are taking. I, Tramol is common. That's one they even call Madaran Sukudai. Now, even among the youth, sir, they have rivalry among themselves. No rivalry in terms of dominating uh, an area, but that our kind of drug is better than your kind of drug, so we'll take it and show you who we are. <laughs> sir, how can we talk about security and neglect this important segment? Because I wonder, with the establishment of the National Drug Law Enforcement Agency. Why this thing is in the increase? Sir, I had cause to have discussion with the uh, guidance and counselor uh, director at one point, and he told me, sir, that there is a man who sells drugs just by the main gate here. You don't know that he's selling drugs. But all our students, those who take the drugs, know about that man. That you, you, you can imagine within the Samaru community, if the students here who are supposed to serve as model of the society are also linked to that, then how many of these drug dealers do we have in Samaru? Sir, like everybody is saying as an insider, in what way can the country approach this menace of drug abuse? Somebody is making a remark here that is their choice. And I think it's a very horrible remark. It's not their choice. They are victims of what we are complaining about, social injustice. Thank you, sir. <laughs> you see, a lot has been said about the issue of leadership and security in this country. Much has been said about the uh, refusal of the presenter to come out with most of the salient points that he has not raised, which have been perhaps uh, raised by Professor Enoch. My, my point here is one is a question, and the second is an observation. 